Hey everyone, this is Neo once again from the Overshocker magazine and today what I have for you is the ASRock X570S Phantom Gaming Riptide Motherboard. For the duration or the remainder of this review, I'm just going to call it the Riptide Motherboard. Anyway, so what makes this motherboard tick? Well, it's the X570. I'm not even sure if I should say X570S chipset because I don't believe it's actually a new chipset or new silicon at all, or at least I've been told that it's not new silicon. What is important is that you get all the PCI Express configuration that you had on the X570 originally, and how that's played out on this particular motherboard is in very interesting ways. But before I get to that, let's just talk about the basic features that exist on this $189 motherboard or 3,600 Rand if you're here locally. And those features are two ARGB headers, two RGB headers, of course, two USB 3.0 headers, one USB Type-C header, a clear CMOS button, and a BIOS flash button at the, on the rear I.O. rather. And you can also get two M.2 sockets. Rather, you actually get three, but the other one is just for your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth dongle or adapter, which you would add at a later point. But the two M.2 sockets that you have for storage are both Gen 4. One obviously from the CPU, the other one from the PCH. And talking further about M.2, another thing that I would have wanted to see on this board is shielding on both M.2 sockets. Right now, you only have it on the one closest to the CPU. With that said, let's move on to the power delivery here. So it uses a 10 phase power design, and I think that's split into eight plus two. So two phases for the SOC and eight phases for the V core. And I think, or rather, I believe these are 60 amp chokes that I use here. So you should be able to power everything from the lowliest 5600X or whatever APU, all the way up to a 5950X. Either way, for $189, I think that ASRock has put together quite a nifty bundle here. Of course, there are some sacrifices you're gonna have to make. For instance, there isn't a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port anywhere or socket. So all the USB ports on the motherboard, be it on the rear I.O. or the motherboard headers, they are either 5 gigabits per second or 10 gigabits per second. Another thing that is missing is, of course, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. However, you do get the socket to add that module, as I said to you before. And there's actually on the rear I.O. a space for you to mount the antennas. Now, let's talk the aesthetic element of this motherboard. So this is supposed to be part of the Phantom Gaming series, but nothing about it says Phantom Gaming. I mean, the previous Elfrock motherboard I reviewed was the Z590 uh, Mini ITX board. And I literally said, this is the best looking board or Mini ITX board that Elfrock has ever produced. And that's good for the Phantom Gaming line. But for some reason, they've added the Riptide to this one, which is a cool name to have on a product. I think Riptide is pretty nice but they've actually put together a budget motherboard. It's an entry-level board and it looks the part. For instance, the only part of the RGB that stands out of the RGB lighting, in fact, it could be the only part that has RGB lighting is on the chipset itself. And if you use a bigger graphics card than I used for this, then you can't even see the lighting properly as your graphics card is gonna cover it up. And talking about the graphics card covering the chipset, I used a small graphics card and the temperatures that I recorded on the chipset according to HW Info was about 59 degrees Celsius all the time, didn't matter what I was doing, file transfers or whatever it was. If you add a graphics card that's going to output heat on the chipset itself, I can imagine that temperature is going to be 10, 15 degrees higher. Okay, so let's talk about the performance part of this board and we'll also talk uh, at the same time about the overclocking because frankly those two things go together. So, in terms of performance, default performance is exactly what you'd expect from any motherboard at this point. I think the only variations you get in performance, perhaps right in the beginning when they're trying to sort out their biases, their firmware revisions, all sorts of things. But as the platform matures, those variances between default operation between motherboards, that actually just goes away. So it's not really worth covering that here. What I will cover is my overclocking experience with the board. So I was able to get 4.8 gigahertz single core or a little bit higher, like 4.85 gigahertz single core using PBO. 
But with PBO here, you are using obviously the AMD submenu within the BIOS. You can only go up 200 megahertz and the CPU is more than capable of that. In fact, the, the efficient cores here, or rather the cores that have the most overclocking headroom can actually go to about 4.9 gigahertz, but just using a PBO, I couldn't exactly get there. But setting a more traditional overclock, like a dumb OC is what I call it now, I was able to get 4,650 megahertz of the 5600X, but that speaks mostly to the CPU, not necessarily to the motherboard. The motherboard here is supposedly capable of doing DDR4-5000, obviously overclocking, right? Using the overclock settings. However, on the QVL right now, you'll see that memory support only goes up to 3,600. So I don't know how they're getting to that 5,000, but suffice to say it should be possible because I don't think there's an AMD motherboard out there that can't overclock memory pretty decently, you know, given that you can also do a different gear ratio. Why am I talking gears if I'm talking Intel? But it's the, generally the same thing, right? You don't have to run one-to-one -one with the F-clock to get those high memory frequencies. And speaking of that, literally it was so easy to get DDR4 4800 working on this motherboard using a 3600 kit, right? I'm using a uh, XPGE die kit. You can actually check out that review in the description below this video. So I don't doubt that you can actually do DDR5000 on this motherboard, given that 4800 was just so easy. It's almost ridiculous. It's as easy as just enabling XMP really on the board. So that's pretty awesome. And as far as extracting performance from this board or getting that sort of performance, so that's my PBO overclock, my dumb OC, and setting the memory voltage and frequency dead simple like overclocking on this board literally took was less than two minutes just so so simple and i actually do appreciate that it speaks to platform maturity and just speaks to the asrock uefi which as you know i have always loved now talking further about software that comes from asrock we have the nahimic right the audio so i'll divert a little bit when i'm talking about audio and i'll get back to the nahimic software since this is a budget board, it's using an older ALC codec. I think it's the 889 or 8 something. Basically, it's the 800 series codec. Some people might frown, up, frown upon that because it's not as advanced as the 1220 or even the 4000 series that some other board vendors are using. But again, this is an entry level board, so you just have to be mindful of those things. And how many of you can genuinely tell the difference between an ALC 889 and a 1220 codec, right? So really, it's not gonna make much of a difference for most people. But getting back to the software, the Nahimic software that they have for this motherboard, I think is brilliant. You know, it looks so good and it works pretty well. Now, in contrast to the Nahimic audio, you get the ASRock tuning utility. I don't have many issues with this outside of that. It's slow to use, it starts up slowly and it doesn't have resizable windows. Meaning if you are working on a 4K monitor, you are out of luck because everything is so small. I don't know why we don't have resizable windows on such software. And again, ASRock isn't the only board vendor that has this issue that makes software you can't resize. And that also speaks to the ASRock advanced weights, ASRock ARGB LED. So on the desktop it's like ASRR RGB LED like it's a, it's a strange name that program literally takes about 50 seconds to start up it's not usable because every time you want to change the colors on the chipset uh, 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 RGB LEDs you're going to have to sit there and wait you can wait in fact you know what wait with me let me show you in real time how long this actually takes watch wait wait and you're still going. You see what I mean? Every time you wanna start the program, this is what you're gonna to have to go through. That's a no-no for me. And if it seems like as if I'm nitpicking, that's because everything else on the board is so good. So something like this, when it comes to software, actually stands out. But overall, for a $189 motherboard, a 3600, yeah, 3600 Rand board, 
I don't think you're gonna get a better offering than this one, particularly if you are insisting on going X570. Because let's face it, this board at this price is cheaper than many of the premium B550 motherboards. I would have liked it to be in the Steel Legend series rather than the Phantom Gaming, because as I said, nothing about it looks Phantom Gaming. Outside of that and the software that is a bit dicey, I think there's really nothing wrong with this board and I would have no issues recommending it for someone who's buying on a budget and insisting on getting X570. And with that said, let me know what you guys think of this board. Do you like it visually? Are you, would you even consider buying an X570 board at this juncture, you know, uh, given that you've got B550 options and so forth. Until then, remember to share, like, subscribe and all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys on the flip side. Take care and peace.